Hey guys! Okay, so we are still reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. We're on chapter 3, page number 38 of the Scholastic Press edition. So, last time we found out that Harry is not going to have to go to secondary school, which is kind of like... For us, it's a combination of junior high and high school. Um, in England, at about 10 years old, they go to this, or 11 years old, they, they start going to secondary school. He got, remember last time, he got a letter, and unfortunately, um, he didn't get to keep his letter. Uncle Valar Vernon stole it from him, which, you know, you can get in big trouble with if, uh, if that happens here in, in the USA. But... Since he's a kid and he can't exactly stop Uncle Vernon, whole oh well. But we're going to find out what's going to happen the next day because yesterday for Harry, he got a new room. And of course, you know, Dudley was not happy about it, right? Here we go. The next morning at breakfast, everyone was rather quiet. Dudley was in shock. He'd screamed, whacked his father with his smelting stick been sick on purpose, kicked his mother, and thrown his tortoise through the greenhouse roof. And he still didn't have his room back. Wow. Talk about an insane tantrum, guys. Harry was thinking about this time yesterday and bitterly wishing he'd open the letter in the hall. Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia kept looking at each other darkly. When the mail arrived, Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry made Dudley go and get it. They heard him banging things with his smelting stick all the way down the hall. Then he shouted, There's another one! Mr. H. Potter, the smallest bedroom, for private drive! With a strangled cry, Uncle Vernon leapt from his seat and ran down the hall, Harry right behind him. Uncle Vernon had to wrestle Dudley to the ground to get the letter from him, which was made difficult by the fact that Harry had grabbed Uncle Vernon around the neck from behind. After a minute of confused fighting, in which everyone got hit a lot by the salt smelting stick, Uncle Vernon straightened up, gasping for breath, with Harry's letter clutched in his hand. Go to your cupboard! I mean, your bedroom! He wheezed at Harry. Dudley, go! Just go! Harry walked around and around his new room. Someone knew he had moved out of his cupboard, and they seemed to know he hadn't received his first letter. Surely that meant they'd try again, and this time he'd make sure they didn't fail. He had a plan. The repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock the next morning. Harry turned it off quickly and dressed silently. He mustn't wake the Dursleys. He stole downstairs without turning on any of the lights. He was going to wait for the postman on the corner of Privet Drive and get the letters for number four first. His heart hammered as he crept across the dark hall toward the front door. Arrgh! Harry leapt into the air. He'd trodden on something big and squashy on the doormat. Something alive! Lights clicked on upstairs, and to his horror, Harry realized that the big, squashy something had been his uncle's face. Uncle Vernon had been lying at the foot of the front door in a sleeping bag clearly making sure that Harry didn't do exactly what he'd been trying to do. He shouted at Harry for about half an hour and then told him to go and make a cup of tea. Harry shuffled miserably off into the kitchen, and by the time he got back, the mail had arrived right into Uncle Vernon's lap. Harry could see three letters, three addressed in green ink. I want, he began, but Uncle Vernon was tearing the letters into pieces before his eyes. Uncle Vernon didn't go to work that day. He stayed at home and nailed up the mail slot. See, he explained to Aunt Petunia through a mouthful of nails, if they can't deliver them, they'll just give up. I'm not sure that'll work, Vernon. All these people's minds work in strange ways, Petunia. They're not like you and me, said Uncle Vernon, trying to knock in a nail with a piece of fruit cake Aunt Petunia had just brought in. On Friday, no less than twelve letters arrived for Harry. As they couldn't go through the mail slot... They had been pushed under the door, slotted through the sides, and a few even forced through the small window in the downstairs bathroom. Uncle Vernon stayed at home again. After burning all the letters, he got out a hammer and nails and boarded up the cracks around the front and back doors so no one could go out. He hummed tiptoe through the tulips as he worked and jumped at small noises. 
I'm going to have to find that song for you so you can hear it. On Saturday, things began to get out of hand. Twenty-four letters to Harry found their way into the house, rolled up and hidden inside each of the two dozen eggs that their very confused milkman had handed Aunt Petunia through the living room window, while Uncle Vernon made furious telephone calls to the post office and the dairy, trying to find someone to complain to, Aunt Petunia shredded the letters in her food processor. Why would you shred them in a food process? Well, all right, guys. Who on earth wants to talk to you this badly? Dudley asked Harry in amazement. On Sunday morning, Uncle Vernon sat down at the breakfast table, looking tired and rather ill, but happy. No post on Sundays, he reminded them cheerfully, as he spread marmalade on his newspapers. Woo, he's really, like, disoriented. I mean, usually you put marmalade, like, jam on your toast? No darn letters today! Something came whizzing down the kitchen chimney as he spoke and caught him (laughs) sharply on the back of his head. Next moment, thirty or forty letters came pelting out of the fireplace like bullets. The Dursley stopped, but Harry leapt into the air, trying to catch one. Out! Out! Uncle Vernon seized Harry around the waist and threw him into the hall. When Aunt Petunia and Dudley had ran out with their arms over their faces, Uncle Vernon slammed the door shut. They could hear the letters still streaming into the room, bouncing off the walls and floor. Someone is very determined to get this letter to Harry. Or a letter. That does it, said Uncle Vernon, trying to speak calmly, but pulling great tufts out of his mustache at the same time. I want you all back here in five minutes, ready to leave. We're going away. Just pack some clothes. No arguments. He looked so dangerous with half his mustache missing that no one dared argue. Ten minutes later, they had wrenched their way through the boarded-up doors and were in the car, speeding toward the highway. Dudley was sniffling in the back seat. His father had hit him around the head for holding him up while he tried to pack his television, VCR, and computer in his sports bag. None of which would ever have fit. (laughs) They drove. And they drove. Even Aunt Petunia didn't dare ask where they were going. Every now and then, Uncle Vernon would take a sharp turn and drive in the opposite direction for a while. Shake him off! Shake him off! He would mutter whenever he did this. Goodness, that's rather paranoid, isn't it? They didn't stop to drink or eat all day. By nightfall, Dudley was howling. He'd never had such a bad day in his life. He was hungry. He'd missed five television programs he'd wanted to see, and he had never gone so long without blowing up an alien on his computer. (laughs) <laughs> Spoiled. Uncle Vernon stopped, at last, outside a gloomy-looking hotel on the outs- outskirts of a big city. Dudley and Harry shared a room with twin beds and damp, musty sheets. Dudley snored, but Harry stayed awake, sitting on the windowsill, staring down at the lights of passing cars and wondering. They ate stale cornflakes and cold, tinned tomatoes on toast. Tinned tomatoes are like canned canned tomatoes on toast for breakfast the next day. They had just finished when the owner of the hotel came over to their table. Excuse me, but is one of you Mr. H. Potter? Only I got about a hundred of these at the front desk. She held up a letter so they could see the green ink address. Mr. H. Potter, room 17, Railview Hotel, Cokeworth. Harry made a grab for the letter, but Uncle Vernon knocked his hand out of the way. The woman stared. I'll take them, said Uncle Vernon, standing up quickly and following her from the dining room. Wouldn't it just be better just to go home, dear? Aunt Petunia suggested timidly, hours later. But Uncle Vernon didn't seem to hear her. Exactly what he was looking for, none of them knew. He drove them into the middle of the forest, got out, looked around, shook his head, got back into the car, and off they went again. The same thing happened in the middle of a plowed field, halfway across a suspension bridge, and at the top of a multi-level parking garage. Daddy's gone mad, hasn't he? Dudley asked Aunt Petunia dully late that afternoon. Uncle Vernon had parked at the coast, locked them all inside the car, and disappeared. It started to rain. Great drops beat on the roof of the car. Dudley sniveled. It's Monday, he told his mother. The great Humberto's on tonight. I want to stay somewhere with a television. Monday. This reminded Harry of something. If it was Monday, and you could usually count on Dudley to know the days of the week because of television, then tomorrow, Tuesday, was Harry's 
eleventh birthday. Of course, his birthdays were never exactly fun. Last year, the Dudleys or the Dursleys, excuse me, had given him a coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Still, you weren't eleven every day. Gosh, happy birthday! A pair of old socks and a coat hanger. <laughs> what a gift! Uncle Vernon was back, and he was smiling. He was also carrying a long, thin package, and didn't answer Aunt Petunia when she asked what he'd bought. Found the perfect place, he said. Come on, everybody out. It was very cold outside the car. Uncle Vernon was pointing at what looked like a large rock way out at sea. Perched on top of the rock was the most miserable little shack you could imagine. One thing was for certain: there was no television in there. Storm forecast for tonight," Uncle Vernon said gleefully, clapping his hands together. And this gentleman's kindly agreed to lend us his boat. A toothless old man came ambling up to them, pointing with a rather wicked grin at an old rowboat bobbing in the iron gray water below them. "I've already got us some rations," said Uncle Vernon. "So all aboard!" It was freezing in the boat. Icy sp- sea spray and rain crept down their necks, and a chilly wind whipped their faces. After what seemed like hours, they reached the rock where Uncle Vernon, slipping and sliding, led the way to the broken-down house. The inside was horrible. It smelled strongly of seaweed. The wind whistled through the gaps in the wooden walls, and the fireplace was damp and empty. There were only two rooms. Uncle Vernon's rations turned out to be a bag of chips each and four bananas. He tried to start a fire, but the empty chip bags just smoked. And shriveled up. Don't burn plastic, guys. Seriously, toxic. Blech. Could do with some of those letters now, eh? He said cheerfully. He was in a very good mood. Obviously, he thought nobody stood a chance of reaching them here in a storm to deliver mail. Harry privately agreed, although the thought didn't cheer him up at all. As night fell, the promised storm blew up around them. Spray from the high waves splattered the walls of the hut, and a fierce wind rattled the filthy windows. Aunt Petunia found a few moldy blankets in the second room and made up a bed for Dudley on the moth-eaten sofa. She and Uncle Vernon went off off to the lumpy bed next door, and Harry was left to find the softest bit of floor he could and to curl up under the thinnest, most ragged blanket. The storm raged more and more ferociously as the night went on. Harry couldn't sleep. He shivered and turned over, trying to get comfortable. His stomach rumbling with hunger. Dudley's snores were drowned out by the low rolls of thunder that started near midnight. The lighted dial of Dudley's watch, which was dangling over the sofa on his fat wrist, told Harry he'd be eleven in ten minutes' time. He lay and watched his birthday tick nearer, wondering if the Dursleys would remember at all. Wondering where the letter writer was now, and with that, we'll continue a little more next time. All right, guys, we are on page forty-five, middle of the page, and we're finding out what happens in chapter three of the Scholastic edition, the Scholastic Press edition of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Talk to you guys later. Bye for now.